talk tonight won't be as fun, I guess, as uh, Who Framed Roger's Rabbit, and, um, or uh, you know, it's it's going to be a little bit. I'll, I'll admit it. It's going to be a little bit depressing. Um, as I tell my students in my conservation biology program that for the first 10 or 12 weeks I'm going to depress the hell out of them, but there is hope, um, there is still hope. So uh, with that, what I wanted to do tonight was talk a little bit about uh, the critters, the conservation of, of gorillas that you'll see in the movie. I put up chimpanzee on the screen um, on the title as well. I won't talk much about chimpanzees, but pretty much what's happening to the gorillas are happening to the chimpanzees as well. Now, I have when we think about um, primate conservation and primate um, research, we think, of course, of Diane Fossey, but we also think about Jane Goodall as well. Um, and this is an, another reason why I was really excited about um, giving the introduction to this movie, because coming from Cedar Crest College, which is a women's college, you know, we teach our students to be empowered, to be the next generation of conservation leaders, and um, D Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall are great exemplars of that. Uh, they're certainly flawed, and you'll, if you haven't seen the movie, you will see um, Diane Fossey had some, um, some issues. Um, Jane Goodall's research, some of it has been called into question. Um, but no one can deny the impact that they've had on primate research and primate conservation. So first, some, some background information about gorillas. Um, ho hopefully, I, I'll talk about some, some facts that you may not be aware of. Uh, we think about gorillas, we think about the gorilla, but gorillas actually, there are actually two separate species of gorillas, the western gorilla and the eastern gorilla, as you can see up here in, the, in this picture. So the eastern gorilla is actually the larger of the two species. It's darker in color, it has longer fur, it has a longer face and a broader chest. So overall, it's just a more massive gorilla. The western gorilla that you see here, uh, probably the most iconic uh, uh, characteristic of this species is the reddish forehead. So when you see pictures of gorillas, if they have a, a reddish forehead, they are definitely the western gorilla. Uh, young western gorillas may not have this forehead, so the lack of the forehead doesn't automatically tell you it's an eastern gorilla. So, the western gorilla, both species actually, are also subdivided into two separate subspecies. Now, subspecies are just distinctive um, populations that have traits that separate the two um, from each other, but they're not distinct enough to be considered a, um, separate species. So the uh, western gorilla has um, the cross river species, or gorilla gorilla dearly, and the western lowland gorilla, um, the scientific name is gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. And you can see where, whoop, I keep pushing the wrong button. You can see where um, they are found um, in Africa. The eastern gorilla um, has two subspecies as well. It's the mountain gorilla, and this is probably the most famous of the two subspecies, Gorilla berengi, berengi. And th this is uh, the species that Diane Fossey studied. It, there's also an eastern lowland subspecies of the eastern gorilla. And again, you can see them here, and you can see the, the distribution of the species on the map. So they all occur in equatorial um, Africa, but um, they are separated geographically. Now this is their current geographic range. Uh, like many species, their ranges have contracted due to, ex to local extinctions. So they, they used to be closer together in uh, the geographic range. This is typical gorilla habitat. So here, 
here is the mountain habitat and the lowland um, rainforest habitat. They tend to like open um, habitats with some understory, but no, they tend not to be found in um, the kind of the stereotypical um, rainforest with the closed canopy above them. Um, and they can be found from 1,100 meters all the way up to 4,000 meters in elevation, depending on whether they're a lowland or um, an, a mountain gorilla. So some fun facts about gorillas. So com next to the chimpanzee, the gorillas are our closest relatives. And this is going to become really important when I start to talk about some of the other behaviors um, that are characteristic to gorillas because they have some really remarkable um, behaviors. So depending on which genes you look at, they share between 95 to 99 or percent or so um, DNA with us. So about 95 to 99 percent similarity to humans. Uh, chimpanzees on average are about 99 percent similar to us. And as you can see here, these gorillas are massive. Uh, they don't get very tall. They're about my height, which of course is, is not very tall. Um, but they weigh around three to 400 pounds, at least the males do. The females can weigh up to 250 pounds. And they have remarkable arm reaches. I mean, seven and a half to eight and a half arm spans. So when they put out their arms, they're, they're, they're remarkably wide. And that should come to no surprise because you know, the, the typical gorilla posture, as you see here. And they can live to be about 40 to 50 years in the wild, which is actually quite remarkable um, for um, a large mammal. In, the, in zoos, they've been um, known to live past 60 years of age. Adult males for both species are called silverbacks. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have seen pictures of silverbacks. And they're called silverbacks because of the characteristic silver on their back, hence the name silverback. Um, and these are the dominant males in the troop. And uh, this next point here about protecting their troop is extremely uh, important because even whether it's a whether it's a leopard um, attacking a young gorilla or a poacher attacking a troop, this, these silverbacks will actually will come out and protect the troop. So often the silverbacks are the first um, individuals in a troop that's killed by poachers. Um, they make them their easy targets because they come out to protect the troop. Uh, gorillas produce nests. You know, we often think of birds as, as producing nests, but they produce ground nests. So they basically beat down these large areas. And unlike chimpanzees and other um, higher primates, they're on the ground. So chimpanzees tend to be up in the trees. Uh, gorillas rarely go up in the trees, and they, they nest on the ground, which of course also make them um, vulnerable to poachers. But they move around a lot. They rarely nest two nights in a row in the same nest. So they'll stay a couple of nights, and then they'll, they'll move on. Oops. Okay. They're vegetarians. You know, the, the picture of King Kong and Mighty Joe Young um, is not true. They, they're carnivores. They, they, they're not carnivores. They, if they grab an insect or a small lizard on the, on the vegetation that they're eating, they certainly will eat it but they don't go after meat um, as part of the diet, which is a little bit different than chimpanzees. Um, Jane Goodall discovered early in her work that chimpanzees actually do eat meat. They will hunt down colobus monkeys uh, and eat meat, but, but gorillas do not um, go after meat. Uh, and because they eat so much vegetation, they actually rarely ever drink. The gorillas will drink a little bit in the wild, but they, they tend not to to drink because they get they eat a lot of succulent plants. Probably the oddest part of the diet 
um, is that they will eat dirt. Um, they also will eat their own poop, but I don't want to put that up on the slide. Um, but they eat dirt, and it's thought, there's two hypotheses of why they eat dirt, and, and gorillas are not the only ones that eat dirt. Um, um, chimpanzees will eat dirt, humans eat dirt, it's called geophagy. Um, it used to be thought to be a, a mental disorder, but now it's, it's being rethought. Um, even parrots and tapers will eat dirt. And it's this two hypotheses. It's either to supplement minerals um, in their diet that they don't get in the vegetation, or it's to um, detoxify the food that they eat. Um, clay is actually a very good detoxifier, and some uh, um, indigenous uh, communities will actually cook their foods in clay in order to detoxify um, their food. So vegetation has a lot of secondary compounds. My favorite secondary compound is caffeine. And these, these secondary compounds evolve as protection for the plants against herbivory. So they are, they are toxic and um, noxious. So it's thought that they may eat the dirt in order to detoxify their food. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that, and you'll see this in the movie, that the um, gorillas tend to, to live in groups. Of course, they're called troops. They, uh, they average between 10 to 20 individuals with one adult male, usually that's the silverback, several adult females, and the offspring. When female offspring actually get older, when they get um, sexually mature, they actually leave the troop. And the troop ranges um, around 20 square kilometers, but the troops in the, in the local area will overlap their home ranges. And gorillas generally walk by knuckle walking. Again, the, the stereotypical um, you know, picture of a gorilla is walking on its knuckles. But gorillas actually can walk bipedally, can walk on their hind legs. And I purposely chose this picture, it's a little bit blurry, so it looks a little bit like Sasquatch or Bigfoot, um, but it's not Bigfoot, it's actually a gorilla. And gorillas will walk uh, bipedally, if, uh, especially if they're carrying something. Um, a couple of years ago or so, so, a video of a bipedal walking gorilla went viral on the internet, and everybody was, was uh, amazed, but of course we've known that they will walk bipedally, you know, we've known this for decades, but you know, the internet, I think us, um, science takes a while to catch up on the internet sometimes. Um, probably the most interesting thing, I think, and again, remember how closely related we are to the gorilla, is that the gorilla can use tools. So here's a picture. Um, I'll get it right. So here's a, a gorilla named Ify. She um, chooses um, this long stick to stabilize herself while she hunts for um, vegetation in a swamp. Here's another gorilla using a stick to uh, pick termites out of a nest. And here is a gorilla, I love this one, using a stick as a walking stick as it walks bipedally through um, an elephant pond. Now Jane Goodall found, um, observed chimpanzees using tools early in her research in the 1960s. It wasn't until 2005 um, that gorillas were found to act to use tools. Until Jane Goodall saw, um, observed chimpanzees using tools, th that was one of the traits that was thought to separate us from the other primates, that only humans use tools. Um, and a tool is, is anything that, you know, it's not just picking up something. Um, you ha the animal has to actually choose that object for a particular task for it to be a tool. But now we know that sea otters use tools, octopus use tools, um, so it's not as unusual anymore, but Jane Goodall, when she first saw the, the, the chimpanzees using tool, it was a major breakthrough. 2005, it took a while, but um, gorillas uh, were observed to use tools as well. Um, and gorillas appear to have individual personalities. And you know, as a scientist, you know, I'm always a little, always question this idea of emotions and personalities. Um, but it seems to be fairly um, clear.
clear in these in gorillas and high primates. They tend they seem to to have um, show emotions such as grief and joy. Again, you know, it's not that much of a surprise considering how closely related we are genetically. And gorillas have a basic language. Um, and I put language in quotes because you know the definition of language is, is very a very contentious issue. But they do have sounds that have that relay specific information. And they use it to teach survival schools to their young, how to search for food, they use it in courtship. Uh, and you know, Coco the gorilla is a famous uh, gorilla who learned sign language. And she was able to learn over a thousand signs and can actually understand some base, basic syntax and grammar. So there seems to be some at least basic ability for language in chimpanzees. Um, sorry, gorillas and chimpanzees as well. And mother gorillas are really the ultimate helicopter parent. Uh, here's a picture of a mother carrying her baby. Uh, young gorillas are actually able to walk around on their own for eight months, when they get eight months of age. But they tend, uh, but females will carry them around to uh, their two, three, even four years of age. So uh, you know, these these babies, I guess, are a little bit lazy. They know how to manipulate their parents, just like human kids. Um, so the mothers will carry around their babies until they're two or three years old, even though the babies could certainly walk on their own. And the similarities don't end there. Uh, Chimpan uh, gorillas will have one, generally one child at a time. Gestation period is about nine months. The babies are about four pounds um, in weight. And females generally have a baby every two to three years. Um, and when they're seven to ten years of age, that's when um, gorillas are sexually mature. And my favorite um, fact about gorillas mothers being um, helicopter parents or the ultimate parents, is that it was recently discovered, and just, just about two or three years ago, that female gorillas will actually use a type of baby talk, like gaga goo goo, when they talk to their, their offspring. So the similarities are quite remarkable between humans and gorillas. So those are some of the fun facts. Now some of the not so fun facts. The gorillas are in severe trouble. And Diane Fossey was really the first one to start to talk about this. And she had a unique way of doing it. And you'll see this in the movie, so I won't go into it. It's, um, but she, it, her legacy really is um, the conservation of gorillas. Uh, again, she worked on the mountain gorillas, but all gorillas in general. So the eastern lowland gorilla is one of the lucky ones. It's only endangered. The scale that I have on the top is from the IUCN, Red List, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This is the organi organization that keeps the book on, on species and, and how threatened they are. Um, and so that's the scale that they use. So endangered means unless the threats that are affecting gorillas are stopped in, a, in the near future, they have a high probability of going extinct. And again, the eastern lowland gorilla is the lucky one. It's only endangered. The population is uh, estimated to be between two and 5,000, but this was, came, this was reduced from 17,000 just 20 years ago. The other three gorillas are critically endangered, meaning that they have almost an assured probability of going extinct unless the threats are stopped in the near future. The Cross River um, spe uh, subspecies estimated population of less than 300. The Eastern Mountain, Diane Fossey's gorillas, seven to 800. The Western Lowland, the 95,000 to 125,000, that may seem like a lot, but that, that estimate is very squishy. It's very difficult to census these gorillas. And the population has probably halved within the last 10 years. So the decline is rapid. So when we look at species and how endangered they are, it's not just the sheer numbers. 
is how quickly they are um, declining. So three of the four subspecies of gorillas um, are critically endangered. So what are the threats to these gorillas? These are the, the, most of these are the standard threats to all um, oral endangered species around the planet. The major threat right now is habitat loss and fragmentation. They are losing their habitat. We are cutting down the forests for trees. We are cultivating the forests um, for grazing and agriculture. This is a gorilla that actually raided a banana plantation. We are mining um, their forests for um, materials that's needed for our cell phones. And um, uh, just in general, because of the high population pressure in, in, in Africa, um, they're losing their habitats. And we're fragmenting them up. We're, we're putting them in little pieces so the gorilla populations are separating, so then they're, they're not moving among their habitats. Poaching, which is a major um, theme of gorillas in the mist, is also another major issue. The, this is a ranger with traps, uh, snares, that were set up to catch animals, and gorillas, and, ant and other critters in the forest. This is just what he took in two months. So poaching is a major, major issue with gorillas. Um, they are being um, killed for, for meat, the bush meat trade, the, for, uh, you know, for the hands and their skulls and their skins. Um, war, when there's a lot of instability in this area of Africa, and um, the soldiers are killing gorillas for meat. They're easy as, to catch. As I said, the, the silverback displays, protects its troop from, um, from poachers. They're, it's easy to kill a 400 pound male um, because he's coming right at you and you have a gun. Ebola is actually a major threat. This is something we don't hear about. We've all heard about the, the outbreak of Ebola, obviously, um, among people. And it's, that, of course, is extremely sad and troubling. Um, but literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of gorillas are, being, are dying from Ebola and other zoonotic diseases, diseases that are transferred between humans and primates. Again, because we share so many genes, they catch the same diseases that we catch, but they don't have the immunities. So gorillas have died from the common cold, uh, from contact with, with, with people. So this is a major um, issue. And some populations have been cut in half because of, of Ebola. And ecotourism can be a problem. And I love this picture because you see this gorilla, this young gorilla, grooming this ecotourist. And we always hear ecotourism is a great way to preserve biodiversity because it puts money in the pockets of the local communities. Now gorillas have monetary value beyond their bushmeat. But if this person had the flu, now this young gorilla may end up getting the flu and, and who knows what might happen. So ecotourism, when not done correctly, has been shown to be a problem for gorillas. And of course, climate change. Um, this is eventually will trump all other um, um, conservation issues uh, because you know, the whole planet is changing, the habitat's changing, um, and it's going to f affect the gorillas. So what is being done to preserve the gorillas? Well, we need to have better protected areas and we need to enforce the, these reserves to keep the, the gorillas safe, maintain the populations that we have. And um, all of these are being done. So this is not just something that you know, from, you know, sprang up from, from my, my thoughts. Um, Anti-poaching, again, a major theme of the movie. Poverty alleviation, if we um, help the local communities they're not going to need to go in and ca capture gorillas for bushmeat or chimpanzees or other animals. Sustainable alternatives to hunting of gorillas, to poaching, to forest use, to, so they don't have to cut down the forest, to keep the forest intact. Community-based conservation, get the community involved so they become, they have an ownership of the gorillas and they will protect them. And of course, education. 
There's a move for, to increase wildlife veterinary medicine to actually go out and inoculate the, the gorillas against the diseases. We have to enforce the ban on illegal trade in gorilla products. It's illegal to trade gorilla products across international boundaries. It's a center, it's a um, uh, international agreement on ascites, but it needs to be enforced. Ecotourism, when it's done correctly, can actually be a very powerful way to preserve biodiversity, but it needs to be done correctly. And we need to increase the funding, effective funding, for the conservation efforts that are going on um, to help preserve the gorillas and the chimpanzees and other species in Africa. What we, what we can do, or what can we do? We can you go on an ecotour, go see the gorillas while they still exist, give some money to these organizations that are protecting the gorillas. Uh, buy sustainable wood. Um, again, a lot of the forest is being cut down um, from uh, for the use of, of timber. And support good conservation organizations. There's many out there. As you imagine, um, gorillas are a charismatic species. There's a lot of organizations protecting them. And these are just some of the, the very good ones. And you know, help support them and um, give them the money that they need to go out and protect the gorillas. And there's hope. And I always want to end on a slide that shows that it's not all bleak. It is bleak. I mean, 250 individuals left of, a, of, of the Cross River gorillas has this very small population. Inbreeding can be occurring. A poacher can go in and take out the entire subspecies um, with some guns. But there is hope. Um, you can see here that, that the mountain gorillas have increased in numbers. Again, Diane Fossey's gorillas. This is the, the species that, the subspecies has gotten the most um, attention of all of the gorillas. So we can protect the gorillas and they can come back. It will be slow because of this low reproductive rate, but there is, there, there is hope out there. And who wouldn't want to save a species that, um, that looks like this? Again, very similar to humans. Here's a mother with a brand new baby. Um, caressing her baby. This was taken in a zoo, so there are, it's not a wild gorilla, but again, you know, t taking a look at, uh, at a picture like this um, hopefully will convince a lot of people that gorillas are worth saving. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for everything. It's staggering.